This lecture is a very brief overview of the art that was produced during the ancient Aegean world. And as you can see from this slide, we divide up the Aegean world into three cultural groups. You have the people of the Cycladic Islands, you have the Minoans who lived in the island of Crete, and then the Mykenaeans who lived on the Greek mainland. And we can see down in this map here, there's the Cycladic Islands, here we have Crete, we're going to be focusing primarily on the site of Konosos, and then we have Mycenae right in here, Greek mainland. Now, if we look at this map, we can see that this map shares an important characteristic with most all of the maps that we've been looking at in this class so far, and that is that the geography is dominated by water. In this case, the ancient Aegean world was made up of islands as well as peninsulas. Now, we have then a culture that is dominated by the sea, and for these people, the sea functioned in many different ways. The sea provided um, food in that there were lots of fish that they could fish, the sea also helped with trade, where they could get in their boats and go around and trade with people. And also the sea acted as a natural form of defense, where it's much harder to kind of sneak up on someone and attack if your boat has to come to a shore, you have to anchor, you have to go on to shore. It's much, uh, much more difficult to be uh, secretive about trying to do that. So a lot of uh, positive things in regard to the geography of the ancient Aegean world. All right, let's start with the people of the Cycladic Islands. We have here an artwork, figurine of a woman. This artwork is also sometimes called Cycladic Idol. And with, before we get into this specific work, with the Cycladic people in general, there is a lot of mystery surrounding these people because there's not a lot of evidence that scholars can draw from. First of all, the Cycladic people were prehistoric, which we know means that they did not have written word. So we don't have any sort of historical information that we can take from text to inform our interpretations. The other problem is, is there's very, very little archaeological evidence that has been found associated with this culture. Um, most of it is in the form of small-scale sculptures, or relatively small-scale sculptures, like the ones that we're going to see in lecture today. So all we really know about these people, really, we can surmise from their art. Now I do want to make a comment really quick about material. The uh, material that we see being used in the Cycladic Islands, and we're also going to see this in uh, Greece when we get to classical Greece is marble. Now we know from our studies of the Mesopotamians that marble was a very valuable material and it was a valuable material because it was rare they had to import it in that expense of importing it, the trouble they took to import it in only heightened the, the value of the material. Now here with the Cycladic Islands and later in mainland Greece they're using marble not as a prestige material, but simply because it was readily available, it was abundant. And it's kind of like that um, economic law of supply and demand. The more you have of something, the less valuable it is. So in the case of Cycladic work, and later the classic Greek, we are not seeing marble used to suggest wealth, but it's actually just a practical material to use because of its availability. Now, with Cycladic sculptures, the overwhelming majority of the sculptures are actually what we see here. And I kind of like to say that when you know, you've know you seen one Cycladic piece, you've seen them all, because they, they literally look like this. The difference being that they just vary in sizes. This sculpture was 1 feet 6 inches. That's actually rather large uh, for these type of sculptures. But this is it, um, and the, they're all women. Um, there's only a very small handful of sculptures that represent men. They're, they're pretty much uh, women. And we'll talk a little bit more about this gender difference in the next slide. But the important thing to note, they're primarily entirely depictions of women. 
Um, they're very flat, which is kind of hard to see here, but there is an image of this uh, sculpture or sculpture similar to it in profile, and uh, that's in your book, and so you can see that in your textbook, how thin it is. Um, there is evidence of paint traces, which indicate that they were originally painted, and in fact, most ancient work is originally painted. I um, encourage people to um, assume that an ancient piece was originally painted, and you usually will be correct to, uh, to make that assumption. Now, with the Kikladic sculpture, the style is very consistent, which is why they all look the same. So they're flat, as we talked about, and you can see that they have a geometric quality to them, which you can see in the triangular feature here of the nose, in the kind of like rectangular sort of appearance of the torso with the bending of the arms and then you have the pubic triangle. You also have um, curvilinear shapes which uh, you can maybe say are geometrical that are in the form of cylinders, so the cylindrical. Um, you can see that this style is very abstract. It is not true to life and that's something else important to note as well. They're also very simple. We don't have a lot of detail um, nor do we have any sort of, well, we have some to some extent, but really not a lot of proportional accuracy. Now, as we saw with the Venus of Willendorf way back in the Paleolithic period, we have a similar situation here with the treatment of the feet, where it looks like she's up on her tiptoes. And we know from our studies of Venus of Willendorf that this indicates that the sculpture is not able to be standing that it can't support it, the weight through the feet. It's not meant to be displayed upright. Now, what this means in this case, we know with the Venus of Willendorf, it meant that she was handheld, uh, likely. Here, it's actually meant to be, from what we believe, an indication that the figure is meant to be laying down, laying down. And what's significant is that these figures, these figures that are laying down, are found in grave sites. So maybe the laying down is intended to suggest that the figure is deceased. Now, I just want to talk for a minute about Kikladic grave sites. Um, they did bury their dead into groups, kind of like a cemetery or a necropolis, and the graves were uh, for families, for single family units, or they could be for small local groups. Um, they're pretty consistent in their form in that basically they just kind of dug a hole uh, pretty much in the form of a rectangular pit that they would line along the side with stone slabs. And it's more kind of like a grave or a tomb rather than a grave because they would put a stone slab roof, like kind of like a lid over this rectangular uh, pit that they had created. So the, the form's pretty consistent, but it does vary in size. Uh, some graves were bigger than others, and some of the grave goods that were found in the graves ranged in quality. Some were better than others. And we also know that these figures found in the grave ranged in size. We know that it's um, very safe to connect size or scale with the idea of hierarchy. The larger something is, the more power it represents. So this could be a representation that there were certain levels of hierarchy um, within the Kikladic culture. We have a feeling because of some of the depictions um, of these figures, the activities that they're engaged in, particularly the men, that and also the presence of grave goods, that there was likely some sort of ritual that accompanied the burial, um, probably giving an offering or putting something into the, the grave site. Now, this is something to think about here because we're looking at this figure, okay, and we see that this figure is nude. And what do we know that nudity tends to very often represent in ancient art? If you said fertility, you are correct. So we have a figure that is communicating this idea of fertility, but it's found in a burial site. And what do we know is the common interpretation that we can make when we see fertility connected with burial? If you said rebirth, you would be correct. A lot of um, scholars believe that these were intended to be um, these kind of like uh, amulets or some sort of object that would help the deceased go into the afterlife. 
Now, we can make this argument, too, because you might say, well, why can't these be portraits of the deceased? We know that in Egypt, right, the mother culture, that they often always put um, images of the deceased in with the, the grave or the tomb. And the reason why is because these are all primarily women. Uh, unless the Kikladic people were a population most entirely of women, this would not be an appropriate interpretation. All right, so here is an example of one of these very rare sculptures found produced by the Kikladic people that depict a male. Now, stylistically, we can see that the uh, style, the sculptural approach is the same, geometric, abstract, with these kind of like fat cylinder tube-like forms, not a lot of detail used to create the form. And what's interesting about the uh, male figures is that the few that have been found um, have either been musicians, they have had a discovery of some of these figures carrying weapons or like wearing a dagger. So this is really interesting because it's almost like they are in sort of like subservient positions, offering a service. Now, when we see this um, figure holding this musical instrument, which is kind of like a harp, there's a couple different interpretations that we can make. And this is something that we saw in uh, Mesopotamia with the bull lyre. Because the bull lyre was found in a tomb, and this image depicting a musician playing music found in a tomb, we can venture similar interpretations that with this depiction of music, that music was either an important part of daily life that um, the deceased wanted to take with them into the afterlife. The presence of this sculpture in a grave could consider be considered perhaps an expression of hierarchy because we know that leisurely activities were reserved for the upper class. Or it could be an indication that music was part of the funerary ritual, which we suspect that there was a funerary ritual attached to um, the process of burying these individuals. All right, let's move on now to the Minoans. And we are going to be concentrating on Minoan art production by looking at the palace at Konosos. Now, in terms of the evidence that we have to help us in our understanding of the Minoans, this is a little, well, I should say a lot better than the um, situation with the Kikladic people. The Minoans were a semi-historic people. They actually had two forms of writing, linear A and linear B, but not both scripts have been translated. Only linear B has been translated. It, linear A has not yet been translated. So we can take some knowledge from these historical texts, but uh, not as much as we would have hoped if both uh, scripts had been translated. Also, there is much more archaeological evidence that has been gleaned from Crete that can help us to create a better understanding of what the Minoans were all about. Now, in my mind, the palace at Konosos is probably the most important site of the Minoans. They built multiple palaces throughout the island of Crete, but this one seems to have yielded the most archaeological evidence that we've been able to use to understand this culture. And in fact, everything that I'm going to show in class has come from this palace. Now, we are looking at a reconstruction, a drawing, because this palace, uh, the foundations pretty much are the only thing that remains. This palace was discovered by Sir Arthur Evans, and he began um, excavation in 1901. And Evans looms as a pretty important figure because um, he really, even to this day, sort of acts as the sole source of information that we look at, we cite, and we uh, consider when teaching and studying the Minoans. Um, I personally have a problem with this. I think that we should look to more than just simply one person as the um, authority. And pe a lot of people, as time is passing more and more, um, you know, now, are beginning to question the accuracy of some of Evans' theories. Now, um, because we haven't seen something revisionist that's too... Uh, too specific for us to really grab onto. Much of what I explain at this point, at least, is uh, 
uh, theories proposed by by Evans and some other people too but primarily Evans now what happened was is in the third millennium BCE on the island of Crete the settlements of people were small and they were spread apart then in the second millennium the settlements kind of began to come together to create larger larger settlements and at the center of the settlements they would build large ornate palaces and even this idea that there are palaces this is something that was suggested by Evans this is even something that people are starting to kind of question that these may or may not have been um, palaces so What's important about the palace is we can see, first of all, it's huge, okay, and it's located at the center of the settlement. Now, the central position of the, the palace, as we know from studying Mesopotamian city planning, centrality is a way to indicate importance. So we can make note of that size just to show importance, centrality to show importance. Now there's other things though. This palace was not simply just for the uh, place for the king to live. And even this I, I, I have some questions about. That it was a king. Maybe it could have been a queen. I think that there's some evidence that um, I think prompts scholars or should prompt scholars to look at that more closely so I'll just say the royalty um, this was not simply a site for the royalty to live this also was not simply a site for the royalty to um, oversee the government this palace is really important because it actually fulfilled numerous functions simultaneously this also the palace was the primary religious site the Minoans did not build freestanding religious structures like the temples that we're more familiar with when we study cultures like ancient Greece or even like ancient Egypt, which we've already looked at. So the palace was the site of worship and the head of the religion, as far as we know, was the king or the queen, the king. It's like a priest king head of the government, the head of the religion. So people coming to, to, to people to practice the religion would come to the palace. In addition, the palace had economic functions. There were people that would come and sell goods here at the palace. We have, and it was believed to be the structure in here, customs. So when, um, kind of like the customs we have today, when goods were brought up from the sea, they'd be processed through here. I'm sure they were taxed and then they would move on for trade. And then um, if you think about this, okay, pretty much anything that the, the people need to achieve they have to come to the palace. You want to get your supplies, your groceries for the week, you go to the palace. You want to practice your religion, you go to the palace. And because everyone's going to the palace to take care of stuff, it even gives the palace a social function where you talk with people, you gossip, whatever. And it's actually pretty brilliant if you think about it because this is like the center of everyone's existence. It allows for the um, king or queen to control kind of everything but also to just be kind of a presence in the lives of the, the people. So a lot of, of functions. Now I just want to show you just for you know interesting photos of what the palace looks like today. The photos I'm going to show you, the first one is this area right in here just off the central courtyard and then the second slide with the plumbing is down in this area here. All right. So you can see that the palace actually is is well built. That the foundations are sturdy and what allows for that is these thick walls that were built using the corbeling process or the load bearing process stacked one on top of the other. You can also see how complex the plan of the palace is. That it involved many rooms, many stairways, uh, chambers, hallways, all of this to allow for the palace to simultaneously fulfill all these functions that we were just talking about. Also, plumbing and irrigation, indoor plumbing, and unfortunately my photograph didn't turn out as I intended, but in here where everything is shadowy, clay pipes that move the water. And something that assists with the plumbing and irrigation is, go back, this actually is built kind of going down a hillside. The hillside allows for multi-storied 
structure. I mean, look at that. One, two, three, four, five, at least five stories tall. That's pretty amazing for the second millennium BCE. Placing it on the hillside also elevated the structure so they, for protection purposes, could see people coming from a distance. We looked at kind of a large compound like this in Mesopotamia. But remember, the Mesopotamian structure had really thick fortifications all the way around for protection. The palace at Konosos didn't need this because they had the sea, as we know, for protection. Then finally, placing it on the hillside and building down like this also allowed for gravity to assist with the plumbing and irrigation. This was really modern stuff for the time period, right? A place that had uh, plumbing and irrigation. And when Evans excavated this, he was so impressed that um, they had a toilet. And in fact, it was, as far as I, if I remember this correctly, it was the first running water toilet in all of human history built by the Minoans. They're pretty incredible architects, and I don't think they get as much credit as they deserve for their engineering feats. Okay, now the palace, we, in the picture we just saw, you just saw all these kind of like plain stone walls. That was not how the palace looked originally. Like I said, with most ancient work, you can make the assumption that it likely was initially painted. And that certainly was the case for the interior at the palace at Konosos. All sorts of gorgeous fresco paintings like the one that we see here. Now before we get into um, the, the specifics of the fresco paintings, I want to talk about the technique of fresco itself. The technique of fresco painting in general is painting on plaster. Now we can be and we should be more specific with this. There are two types of fresco painting. There's buon fresco and fresco secco. Now buon fresco is considered to be like the true fresco, which is painting on wet plaster. The way that it would work is the artist would take pure pigment, so they don't need a binder or anything that would adhere the pigment to the wall. They would paint on wet plaster. The plaster would dry, would absorb the pigment, making the pigment permanent part of the wall. Now there are benefits and drawbacks to this. The benefit is that it's a very permanent form of painting, which is great. The drawback is that um, it really limits time. So you can't just like paint up a whole wall with wet plaster, paint a little here, paint a little there. You can only paint what you can in one sitting. The other problem is, is as fresco ages, the aging becomes apparent, buon fresco, and you can see the areas, the sections that the artist paints. And that sort of aging kind of can interrupt the overall legibility of the work as we look at it, you know, in a more recent time period. The other type of fresco painting is fresco secco, which is dry, painting on dry plaster. This is fantastic because you can take all the time you want. You don't have any time constraints of, you know, a material drying. The problem is, though, that um, because the wall itself is separate from the painting, what's happened over time is that moisture has gotten in between the paint and the wall and has caused it to flake away. So it's not as permanent of an approach as it is with the Buon technique. Now the Minoans, again, being the brilliant people that they are, that they don't get enough credit for, they actually did something really rare that we don't commonly see in art. They used both techniques simultaneously to get the best of both worlds. So they would paint with the Buon to um, get that permanence, but then they would come in after it dried with the Secco to render detail, those minute details that take kind of a long time to uh, to add on to the composition. So again, the Minoans deserve more credit. Now, for the majority of paintings found at the palace at Konosos, the typical subject matter is daily religious life. And this is believed to be um, one of these images that um, part of religious ritual was this kind of interaction, a kind of dynamic and acrobatic interaction with a bull. And very commonly, they would have their gods depicted in the form of strong animals. And so this could be kind of a, a representation or reference to a powerful god. Probably a male god, since it's this like huge bull with um, all of these, these horns. 
So what we see here is we see two figures that seem to be kind of controlling the interaction. We have um, somebody like holding the horns of the bull or else like doing some kind of acrobatic maneuver on them, which is crazy. And then someone that seems to be directing or kind of choreographing and then the acrobatic maneuver uh, happening over here. Now what's interesting is the skin tone. And we talked about this when we studied Egyptian art. The Minoans did the same thing. They used color to denote gender, where you have the um, darker skin here to indicate male, lighter skin to indicate female. And what's interesting is the females are clearly taking the more active role in directing the um, the ritual and they're also taking a much more kind of physically dangerous role and this is just a little bit of an unexpected thing to see when you know stereotypical gender roles are that you know women you know they're not active they're passive they're timid they um, can get hurt easy this seems to subvert all of that which is I think something interesting to consider uh, when we think about what might be the true role of gender within the Minoan culture now the other great thing about the Minoans, again they deserve more credit, is uh, they were super talented when it came to ceramics. Um, they made lots of ceramic vessels. The most common subject matter on these vessels, sea life. And that should not be a surprise to us because we understand the geography of uh, the Minoan culture and the wider Aegean culture. Sea dominated their life, it dominated their landscape. So they um, have these vessels and they're gorgeous. First of all, the vessel itself is very sophisticated and one of the things that lends that sophistication is the newly introduced potter's wheel. The potter's wheel is very important because you take the wet clay and if you've seen the movie Ghosts you'll certainly understand how this works. You take the wet clay and you use your hands as the wheel spins and you have water to keep everything smooth, you use your hands to form the vessel. The turning of the wheel ensures that the vessel's walls have a consistent thickness throughout the, throughout the vessel. When you hand build, which usually like you coil and you stack and then you kind of smooth, it's very hard to get that perfect uh, thickness with the entire vessel. Also typical is that they created polychrome vessels, which means that there were multiple colors. I think this is a fantastic vessel. You have all these like squiggles, uh, proper art historical terminology, expressive lines that seem to evoke the motion of the sea. You have these swirls up here that also seem to be evocative of the sea or like um, riptides or whatever. You have this really dynamic image of this fish leaping. And I love it that um, there's so much energy in Minoan painting. Even here if we go back, you know, leaping and leaping. It's just so energetic. And below is this uh, similar form that maybe perhaps is a net. And then the snake goddess. Now, as I mentioned before, different from Mesopotamia and certainly different from Egypt, there's no temples, freestanding temples, but they also did not create large scale sculptures or monumental statues of kings or queens or gods. This, this didn't happen in Crete. Um, but they did make small scale sculptures in the round, like what we see here, or smallish, depends on what your definition is, one foot to 1.5 inches. And this is kind of like a, the same situation of the Cycladic Idol, where they actually made tons of these that look just like this of varying sizes. And in fact, this figure, the snake goddess, is highly ubiquitous in Minoan art. And she shows up on um, in paintings, she shows up in sculpture, she even shows up in jewelry. The repetition of her image over and over and over again certainly indicates a level of importance. Now, scholars are kind of divided. Who is this person? Some people say she's not a goddess, that instead she is like, um, a, like a priestess, like a woman who in, attends to religious duties. I tend to disagree with this because, one, of the re repetition of the image. Repetition indicates importance. There's other clues here 
that also indicate that she could be more of like a godlike status. Um, okay, so let's take a look. We'll start at the top, we'll work our way down. On top of her head, we have what looks like a feline form. And felines traditionally represent protection, so it could be a representation that um, she has some sort of protective role, which gods and goddesses tend to do. The fact that the feline, which is such like a ferocious wild animal, is sitting so uh, tame on top of her head um, could indicate that she has control over the natural world. And you could support this interpretation by the fact that she holds these snakes. She also has control over these snakes. Um, the snakes have been interpreted by many as phallus, phallic symbols, which are symbols that are visually similar in appearance to erect male genitalia. And so you can argue that the snakes are, you know, symbolizing control over the natural world, or you could argue fertility. Do you see anything else in the sculpture that may support a fertility interpretation? The exposed breast. So we actually have fertility, uh, male fertility sort of juxtaposed with female fertility. And what this could indicate is perhaps she's like a mother goddess, which would um, strongly affiliate her with ideas of creation. If this is a god, it also shows that the Minoans may have also fashioned their gods within the image of man, in addition to uh, animals. And what I would argue is probably the bull that we saw in the previous um, slide it would make that a, an association with a god and not necessarily a representation of a god. Now moving on, we're going to look at um, the Mykonians, and I actually am only going to show a couple images from this um, culture, architectural images. Here is a citadel, and I just wanted to show you this citadel to contrast with the uh, palace at Konosos. So it's similar to Konosos in that we have a rambling structure, very large in size, but the difference is the fortifications, right? The thick, heavy walls that surround. Why do we see fortifications here and not at the palace at Konosos? If you were thinking about geography, you would be correct. They're on the Greek mainland, so people could come down from the north and they could sneak in and attack. So this is for protection. This is a detail of the fortifications. These are huge, huge heavy stones built in the corbeling process. The Mykonians, they were super adept at working with this uh, corbeling process. This is proven by looking at this structure here, the treasury of Atreus. And um, with this structure, we are looking at a burial mound. Now, as we've seen in this class, there are specific names for specific burial mounds. I will talk about the specific name for this burial mound in the next slide. Now, for the Mykonians, people who were wealthy had the privilege to be buried outside of the city walls in burial mounds. And of course, the more powerful, the bigger your burial mound. This is probably the best preserved of the mound. And this is also another example of one of those mistakes in art history that nobody corrects. It just kind of sticks. So it's called the Treasury of Atreus, and um, that's actually incorrect. It's not a treasury, it's a tomb. What happened was when it was discovered by Heinrich Schliemann, who made all kinds of errors in his archaeological career, there was all these like fancy treasure, you know, fancy um, items and so treasury, but later it was discovered it was a tomb, and actually all those fancy items were grave goods, but the name stuck. Now, what's significant about this Mykonian burial mound is first of all, what makes it unique is that it has a dromos, which is an entryway. As you can see here, it's a walled entryway that leads straight to the entry of the tomb. Here's some people to give a sense of scale. The other unique part is the shape of the, the burial mound in a kind of like beehive shape. Now, these burial mounds were produced by the Mykonian are called tholos. Tholos are unique to the Mykonian people. The shape of this burial mound, in addition to its defined entryway, also helped to make it unique in comparison to burial mounds constructed by other 
structures or other cultures, excuse me. Now you can see that they use the corbling process once again to create this structure. Now what's crazy about this is that this tholos built with this corbling process, which is rather simple, is has the largest unsupported interior space. And what that means is that the interior space is open. There's no um, columns or any sort of buttressing. There's nothing holding it up. This remained the largest unsupported freestanding space on our planet for 2,300 years. It did not lose this accolade until the construction of the Pantheon just during the time of ancient Rome. This is pretty crazy that they're able to create such a revolutionary structure, which again supports my assertion that like the Minoans, the Mykonians are not getting the credit they deserve as really amazing architects.